Welcome, uh, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Fabio Costa, uh, who's looking at us from the University of Queensland in Australia, and he's going to talk to us about process matrices and quantum causal structures. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you, Kai, for uh, organizing the, the talk, and uh, apologies, everybody, for uh, uh, the, um, the rescheduling. We had some, uh, some trouble uh, coming here to Orange, but we're here now. And, and yeah, we are aware it's not the most usual time, but maybe uh, other people that are not present might be able to catch up uh, later on on, uh, on the recording. So today I would like to tell you a bit about uh, uh, my work of a um, uh, few years. Uh, so I will give a, a very general introduction uh, about some uh, uh, formalism that uh, uh, we've been putting together with colleagues. Um, I will uh, uh, give some reference this throughout the talk, throughout the talk. Um, so yeah, just to say this is not just my uh, my work alone, but it's been the work with uh, many colleagues. And uh, um, uh, the topic is about uh, um, causal structures and quantum mechanics. So uh, to start right away, um, um, the the starting point of this uh, of this talk is uh, uh, a sort of discomfort in the way uh, canonical quantum mechanics. Uh, is uh, formulated uh, that breaks uh, uh, in, a, in a main way the sort of symmetry between space and time that we have, uh, for example, in special relativity or in uh, classical field theory. So if you want to have a, a picture of uh, what, uh, how do you describe events in space time, uh, the way that quantum physics, uh, and also most of classical physics, although you will have to do it that way, works is that uh, uh, you consider, okay, let's say you want to describe a set of events, so these are a set of observations that uh, you want to make, and what you need is that you lay out some coordinates, some background space-time, and uh, um, uh, you set up some initial state, and then you make it evolve, and then you will have some, uh, some light construction that will, will tell you which events are causally related to each other. So the point here is that uh, 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 to even talk about uh, the events, you need to know where they are located in space time and to know how, what will be the causal relation between each other. You need to know uh, beforehand what are the causal relations between, uh, between those events. Now, the question, and, and, and this is something that we can abstract um, uh, in, uh, in, in the circuit model. If we want to uh, describe that a bit more abstractly uh, about this type of processes, we can just say that there is some, uh, again, some initial state. And then uh, we will uh, leave that. Uh, yeah, I have the mouse to point. Uh, events we can represent as uh, quantum operations or quantum measurements. And then uh, uh, causal relations and evolution between events will be represented by quantum gates or uh, in general some quantum interactions between systems. And so again, we see that the, um, the causal relation between events has to be set beforehand uh, uh, in this type of model. Now, uh, there are reasons. Uh, for which one wants to go uh, beyond the scheme, uh, a scheme where causal structure is, uh, is set beforehand. One of the main, main motivations is uh, uh, combinations between uh, quantum theory and gravity. Now, when you uh, think about general relativity, we know that matter bends space time. And so, uh, in a way, it determines uh, so the state of your system, determines the causal structure. Now, if you start to think about a, a quantum system uh, uh, that can be superposition, then it's natural to think you might have a, a quantum causal structure that can also be in superposition. And so uh, the, the, the framework where uh, the causal order, the causal structure is set beforehand is not suitable to describe these situations. Um, and uh, I will briefly discuss this, uh, uh, but we, uh, we discuss a particular example in some detail in this, uh, in this paper with uh, Magdalena, Igor, and Chasla. Um, a second motivation is that uh, uh, in fact, even beyond the uh, quantum gravity scenarios, the causal structures, quantum causal structure can be uh, an interesting resource in the feasible scenarios. And I will, again, I will uh, try to go this uh, in a little more detail later, but uh, essentially there are some tabletop experiments that uh, um, of course do not go beyond uh, known physics, but are better analyzed uh, in the language of quantum causal structure that highlights some possible advantages for uh, uh, quantum information tasks. And finally, there is a reason that doesn't even have to do with, uh, um, with quantum causal structure, but the causal relation in general between, uh, between system and quantum systems. Uh, in general, when you talk about uh, things like distributed computation, so that's a scenario where you have uh, different nodes that have to communicate to each other uh, uh, to, to make a computation, which is, for example, internet. Uh, now, there is a very 
present pressing issue that is uh, you, you cannot know in advance what is the correlation between all the events. So you have all these computers that will make uh, operations all the time and send uh, messages to each other. And because you can have uh, uh, delay faults, uh, time errors, your clocks are not perfectly synchronized, you have to take into account that uh, the ordering of events is something you have to establish on the fly. So this is something very important in uh, classical communication networks, and we expect it will be also important in quantum communication networks. And so that's another uh, scenario in which you cannot have a preset order of events. Now, okay, that's the motivation. How, how do we do it? Now, uh, if we remove the, the causal order of events from quantum theory, what are we left with? Well, uh, certainly we, we have to take away space and time, and we have to take away the light cones, and we also have to take away the initial state, because the initial state, uh, you, you know that it's initial because it's before in time relative to all the events you consider. Uh, so that seems to take away pretty much all the structure. And when you consider the circuit model, it's instead of having these divisions of uh, states and gates and so on, all you can say is I have a bunch of events and there is some block around those events uh, that somehow is supposed to uh, identify what they're doing. So uh, what I will talk about is essentially how to define and characterize and make sense of this block. So the idea is that uh, um, we give a primacy to the events. Uh, so we consider a scenario where we can talk about events and uh, everything else, uh, the, the causal structure, the, the evolution, the initial state has to be somehow encoded in this block that connects the events. Okay, so the starting point for this is clearly uh, uh, what are quantum events. Uh, now I'm going to be to go relatively quickly through this because I assume the audience is familiar. If the audience is not familiar, it's actually not uh, essential to get the main idea of the topic. But so uh, we learned that quantum events, um, so here by quantum events, I really mean observable uh, things. So for example, uh, if you measure this projection of a spin on a particle and you see spin up, that's an event. Now, uh, in kindergarten, you learn these things that are described by observables. Now, observables, uh, um, a, a, a bit more mature way, the elementary school way to uh, describe observable is uh, P of Ms. So, uh, this will be a set of uh, uh, positive operators that uh, uh, sum up to the identity. And uh, what I want to draw attention on is the Bohr rule. Uh, uh, that gives us the probability for a, a certain event. So the event is uh, described by an operator and the probability is given by the, this trace rule here. Right, so in this case, uh, we have that the state is what represents the scenario that describes uh, our, uh, um, the probabilities for our events. And so operationally what it is, is that we imagine that we have some measurement device or anything that uh, makes sense to say records this event. And we have a quantum system going in described by Hilbert space and we make a measurement now, the limitation of this picture is that uh, it uh, doesn't describe how the system uh, is the, uh, transformed by the measurement. Uh, now, because as a particular case, we want to have uh, um, events that are time-like or that are causally influence each other, we need to go beyond this and uh, you need to use a, a formalism where we can also describe how uh, the act of measurement and more, more general, more generally the act of uh, uh, interacting with the system changes the system. So that's where we arrive to the mature uh, description of events, which is uh, through operation. So an operation is uh, a completely positive map. And operationally, uh, what we're talking about is uh, we imagine we have some measurement device or anything that we can interpret as uh, detecting an event. And uh, the way we describe is with some input Hilbert space and output Hilbert space. And the transformation itself is, is uh, described by a completely positive map. Um, so these are, uh, um, uh, usually, if you think like a measurement, you, you typically think about uh, having the same space in and out, but both for generality and for convenience, as you will see later, it's useful to distinguish uh, input and output space. Um, a, a particular type of uh, uh, event we want to describe is a deterministic one, but so that's not an actual measurement, or it can be a measurement where you discard the outcome, uh, and that's a, a, a CPTP map, a trace per circuit. So that's uh, the same as before, except you add the trace preserving condition to make sure this is a, a deterministic. Uh, now, when you make a measurement, uh, um, you have to consider uh, what is all your space of possible outcomes that's described uh, in the formalism by an instrument. So that's a collection of CP, CP, of CP maps that sum up to a, a trace preserving map. So, for example, if you make your spin on off measurement, you will have two maps one corresponds to spin up, one corresponds to spin down. And when you sum them together, they give you a trace per seven map, which is uh, is in that case uh, uh, just a, um, a defacing map uh, that corresponds to measuring the spin and discard. 
Other particular cases of instruments is, for example, a single element instrument that you can perform a unitary, that is just one element instrument, it doesn't have a measurement output. Now, the main point is, as we said, we want to describe what is this blob. Now, uh, the, the core thing is uh, how do we extract probabilities? How do we assign probabilities in this formalism? So the idea is that we have, a, in some way, someone said, he gave us a way to identify these different events. Uh, and not in space time, I will discuss a little more later how to identify these events. But say that we have these events and we want to be able to assign probability. So, what is, for example, a probability system up here and a system down here and so on? Um, now, uh, the thing is that, that it's enough to uh, make some relatively small assumption uh, about uh, uh, the description of uh, the local description of, uh, of this event to derive the general structure of this uh, probability rule. So if you assume a local quantum theory, what does it mean to assume local quantum theory? First of all, is that local events are described by quantum mechanics, so just as we said by uh, CDMX. Uh, and uh, uh, you make a few more assumptions, which is, uh, uh, for example, non so the main assumption here is non-contextuality. Um, that is to say that the probability, uh, probabilities don't depend on the entire instrument or on the context. Uh, for example, if you want to, uh, so you know that you can measure, um, make measurements using different settings. You can measure along z direction, x direction, and so on. And the probabilities don't depend on that; only depend on the actual uh, uh, CP map that you are considering. So this is a relatively uh, technical point. I will not go into detail, but the point <coughs> is that uh, if you make a few uh, basic assumptions about uh, log quantum theory being uh, valid locally without making any assumption about the background quantum structure. Uh, you will derive uh, this structure of the probability rule so that uh, it has to be a multilinear function of the CP maps, uh, it has to be positive, uh, and it has to be some up to one. These two simply come from, uh, um, from normalization and positivity of probability. Okay, so this, uh, uh, and, uh, and this function omega is what we call the process. So the process is something that eats up the description of all your local events and spits out a probability. Now, this uh, uh, may sound a little uh, uh, abstract. Uh, perhaps a little bit different modes from what we are used to, although it's not very different to sort of algebraic description of a, of a state. But uh, uh, there is a very, very neat trick to uh, make it look much more familiar. And this is the chiasomorphism. So that's essentially uh, we take the CP maps and we uh, can represent them as a state or, or as operator. So the way to do it is that you consider a maximum entangled state, you apply the, uh, the map to it, and, you, and then you obtain a bipartite. So instead of uh, talking about uh, uh, maps, now events are essentially represented in the same way as states. So as uh, operators that live uh, in the tensor product of input and output space. Uh, this is the technical definition of the, um, of the isomorphism. I will not uh, spend much time on it, except saying uh, that uh, these event operators now have the property that uh, they are uh, um, positive semi-negative. So just like uh, uh, quantum state, or actually just like uh, uh, P of EM elements, which is maybe the, the more uh, the, the better uh, analogy here. So okay, so again uh, to uh, to summarize, now we have uh, events that are described by positive operators. So that's really the same way as uh, in uh, ordinary quantum physics, except uh, now the events uh, also describe the transformation of the system and not just uh, its measure. And now when you put all this together and you describe, you take those properties of our uh, um, uh, probability rule. Uh, you see that you have a, a, a representation through a Born rule, which is really just the same, uh, uh, exactly the same structure as in ordinary quantum physics. So you have that the probability to observe an event uh, mj, mk, and so on is given by the trace of the tensor product of all these, uh, of all these uh, event operators times some object w. Now, what is this object w? That's what represents the process, and that's what we call process matter. So to draw the analogy with the usual uh, Born rule, these event operators take the place of what usually is the uh, uh, POVM elements, and is a, a process matrix takes the place of what usually is the density matrix. So uh, the, the structure is actually exactly the same, except now um, these probabilities can represent any causal relations between, uh, um, between events, not just uh, uh, independent uh, um, measurements. So the process matrix is something that lives in the tensor product of all input output spaces and has uh, a few properties that uh, uh, ensure positivity and normalization of probabilities. Okay, so uh, so this is the core of the formalism. Uh, now it's uh, uh, quite interesting. This formalism has been derived uh, many times for many different purposes. Um, uh, most of this work is about causally ordered uh, uh, 
uh, uh, scenarios because, uh, as I will mention later, this is actually very useful formalism even to deal with causally ordered quantum mechanics. Uh, you can get more than uh, um, you do for an open system more than uh, what you get from usual uh, the usual formalism. Uh, and there are a few other uh, uh, ideas that have been uh, uh, put around and that converge with the same formalism. I don't list everything here because uh, there will be more of this space on the page. Um, but yeah, so just to say this is something that uh, uh, seems that uh, many ideas converge on, the, on this same structure. So actually the, the structure itself seems to be quite useful by itself. Okay, now to touch base with something we're a bit more familiar uh, with. Uh, let's see how to represent uh, the particular scenarios that we have used to in, uh, in quantum mechanics. Actually, I should keep an eye of time. So, uh, so because uh, what we said is that we want a formalism that uh, doesn't mean that I can put a structure, but as a particular case, we should be able to reproduce all the known uh, situations in quantum mechanics. So how about the situation where, uh, so we will call uh, the two events uh, as events measured by Alice and Bob as is customary, and we consider just two uh, for simplicity. So how about the situation where Alice and Bob just receive a state? Okay, in this, state, in this case, the, uh, the process just reduced to uh, simply having a state on the input space of the two um, of the two sites or the two events, and then identity on the output space. Uh, and when you when you uh, crank in this probability rule, what you have is that uh, these uh, uh, operators that represent the CP maps actually reduce to the P of M elements. So this is how you represent the standard situation of uh, uh, causally uh, unrelated events. Now, what if you have uh, two uh, causally related events? So, for example, you have uh, uh, a channel that connects Alice to Bob. So, you have some initial state that goes into Alice. Alice makes a measurement operation. And then there is a channel that goes from Alice to Bob. Well, this is given by process matrix that uh, has uh, uh, the state that Alice gets in the input space of Alice. Then there is an operator that connects output of Alice to input of Bob. And then there is identity on, uh, on the output of Bob. So now you see that uh, uh, this identity is what tells you essentially that uh, uh, the system is discarded uh, after that measurement. So that's the way that uh, the formalism represents um, uh, an event that doesn't have causal influence on anything else. Um, and by the way, yeah, if you have any question or uh, <laughs> the people, are, well, people on uh, looking at the recording will not be able to ask questions, but if people in the audience have questions, please uh, interrupt. Okay, so uh, now what is the most general causally ordered uh, scenario where there is a definite order of events between Alice and Bob? That's a situation where. So, so uh, can I ask a question then? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so uh, you, you put uh, identity for the output because you are not doing a post selection? Yes, yeah, so this is, a, uh, this is not a post selected. Uh, um, uh, so so the, the formalism assumes no post selection. So the idea is that. Oh, yeah, so, but, but, yeah. So that's why you have an identity, right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is, yeah. Now, so is, there any, is, is there any connection with multi-time multi quantum mechanics too? Yes, there is. So that's actually one of the things I should have added in the list uh, of a similar uh, related formalism. It's just uh, depending where I go, I try to add and remove uh, things. But there is a very big list, and one of those is uh, uh, the multi-time formalism. Uh, there is a a crucial difference that in the multi-time formalism, you always assume that there is a definite causal structure, but and, mm -hmm. but then you also assume you can do post-selection. Here it's different. Here we don't assume any background causal structure, but you also assume that uh, all the probabilistic events are encoded in the measurements you are performing. Um, so in, in other words, uh, uh, we, we don't do any, any post-processing or any post-selection. We are describing all these discrete events, uh, there's Alice, Bob, and whatever, they're doing their measurements, and you keep all the statistics. And that's why one of the assumptions is that this probability is sum up to one. Now, if you do something like you, you select uh, on one of these events, uh, you can't really say, well, post select, but not in time because you don't know which is before and which is after. If you select on one of these events, uh, let's say I select an Alice thing spin up, and I ask what is the uh, sort of a conditional process seen by everybody else. What you get is a more general process that uh, uh, that includes post-selection, and so there won't be, for example, identity uh, on the output of Bob. So if, in this case, for example, you post-select on the outcome of Bob, then um, or, or better, better yet, say that there is Charlie after Bob, and then you post-select on what Charlie is doing, 
and Alice and Bob will be connected by something that doesn't have a, the identity of Charlie. On, on Bob, sorry. Okay. So yes, uh, um, Thank you. yeah. Thank you for the question. That, that really helps uh, um, clarifying it. So really important here, there is uh, again no cost selection. So there is Alice and Bob that do the measurement, and and then outside them there is just the the, the word that do, does what what it has to do deterministically. Okay, so uh, this is the most general uh, causal order scenario. So uh, what we have in mind is that there is some environment that is outside the, uh, the lab of Alice and Bob. And so there is some initial uh, state prepared uh, that it can be correlated between Alice and the environment. And then some joint operation between uh, uh, the output of Alice and the environment, and then that goes to Bob. And this is uh, um, represented by this type of, uh, uh, of process matrix where there is again identity on the output of Bob, as we said. As we said, this is uh, representing the fact, the fact that uh, uh, the system that goes out of box goes away. It's not detected, it's not post selected, just uh, not relevant anymore to, for this whole process. Okay, so this is the most general um, causally ordered scenario. Now, does it make sense uh, to consider scenarios that are not causally ordered in this uh, uh, formalism? This is the main question of the, uh, uh, the, the main uh, underlying idea. Now, there is uh, one that is uh, very natural to think about. Uh, think of a scenario where uh, um, you toss a coin and you randomly place Alice before Bob or Bob before Alice. Uh, this is a, a, a very neat uh, representation of the formalism. It is what you should expect in uh, um, something that uses the Bohr rule. It's simply the complex combination of a process matrix that has Alice before Bob and a process matrix that has uh, Bob before Alice. So this is what we call a causal separable uh, scenario. It's just the name uh, in analogy with entanglement, but we shouldn't stretch the analogy too much. So this is a, a scenario where uh, we uh, the causal order is not uh, uh, fixed. We don't we don't know what it is, but uh, uh, but it's classically definite. So we can we can always uh, interpret the scenario as uh, the causal order is there, it's just we don't know what it is. And of course, so the main uh, question is: uh, Are there more general general processes where the causal order is not? You cannot even uh, ask if there is a, a definite causal order. You cannot even say there is a definite causal order underlying. So the answer is yes. Uh, now, the first example we have, maybe we'll not spend much time on this. First example, you just uh, write down some uh, um, some process matrix and you check that it fits all the criteria and you verify that uh, it's not causally separable. Now, this is not very insightful. These are uh, poly matrices uh, uh, written there, but I will not go into detail. The point is that uh, this is a, a, um, an example we cooked up with, but we don't have a physical interpretation. So this uh, uh, might hint at the fact that this uh, uh, formalism that we've described as okay, a sort of a abstract extension of quantum mechanics by removing the assumption of total order, perhaps might be too general, or perhaps is talking about things we don't know yet. Um, it is interesting nonetheless that uh, this type of thing exists. Now, there are uh, there is a, a situation where um, we, as we said, we expect uh, causal relations, indefinite causal relations to appear, and that's when you combine uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity. Um, okay, so now uh, I'll, I'll talk very briefly about this. So this is, uh, uh, a scenario where uh, the key um, source of uh, indefinite causal structure comes from uh, general relativity. So uh, just to recap, what does it mean that uh, causal relations are dynamical in causal general relativity? First of all, how do we identify events in general relativity? You cannot just say, I have space time and I have an event at the point of space time. Uh, because if you want to point a finger at a, a space time event, you need, need something for your finger to point at. In other words, you need some uh, uh, physical uh, reference frame. And this is some, something quite deep that uh, has uh, involved some uh, discussion in the foundations of general relativity, but I believe that the underlying reason is a uh, diffeomorphism invariant that you actually need, uh, you cannot have an absolute uh, physical meaning of event. So what you mean you need is essentially clock. When you say there is an event A and event B, the way you're thinking about, there is a clock going on a word line, another clock going on another word line, and you say something like the second click of clock A is event A, and the second click of clock B is event B. Now, what happens if you uh, bring in a mass nearby one of the clocks? Then the mass causes time dilation, and it slows down the clock of B more than it does clock A, and it can do it as much as to bring the event B in the future line from clock A. If you bring the mass close to Alice, you can bring uh, the event A in the future line from event B. Now, what I want to stress here is that the identification of the events is independent of where you put the mass. You can talk about um, event A and event B without knowing in advance what is their causal relation. So this is something that makes sense in general relativity without even talking about 
uh, indefinite cost of structure. But now this is the way we think about when we, we say we identify events without knowing uh, what is the cost of structure. Now, what happens if, the, if this mass that you're moving around is a quantum mass? Then you can assign some quantum state to putting them to the position of the mass. You can say here, put it to the, to the right or to the left. And now you can also, uh, um, operationally, you can uh, imagine performing some event at uh, some, uh, some operation at event A and at event B. Uh, what we're thinking is that there is some target system that is flying through these two events. And uh, depending on where the mass is, it either goes first to A and then to B, and in this way, in this case, uh, uh, A Alice and Bob performs two unit operations, and uh, in this case, there would be uh, A before and B after. Or if you put the mass to the left, then you will have uh, um, first the unit of Bob and then the unit of Alice. Now, of course, the point is uh, what happens when you put the mass in superposition? Well, because of the linearity of quantum mechanics, there is really one thing that can happen. Um, if we don't want to make any other assumptions about new physics, the only thing that, that can happen is that if you prepare a superposition of the mass right and left, and then you perform this protocol that, as I said, you can do without knowing or detecting where the mass is, um, we will end up in a superposition of those two scenarios, so either A before B or B before A. Now, uh, this is formally uh, the same as what is called, this is called the, the quantum switch that was developed by the Pavia group uh, several years ago. Uh, but it was developed in a, in a different context, in a non gravitational context. But it was developed exactly thinking about uh, uh, indefinite causal structure or superpositions of causal structure. Okay, so that's, uh, that is the idea. And uh, the point is, this is, we described the bit in this, uh, uh, in this way about uh, states and evolution and trying to put together. But the point is that if you use this process matrix formalism, then you can write a process matrix that represents this uh, superposition or this uh, indefinite causal structure. Um, so um, again, this is just a very brief overview, but uh, uh, the particular case, uh, as you remember, the process matrix is analogous to the uh, density matrix, so in general is analogous to a, a, a mixed state. In this particular case, uh, you have something that is analogous to a pure state, and it's exactly the sum of uh, a component that represents uh, A before B and a component that represents B before A. So that's why uh, people call uh, this scenario superposition of causal order. Now I have my own, own issues with this, uh, uh, with this terminology, and that's simply because uh, you're not just superposing uh, uh, WA before B and WB before A, but you have this control system, which is the mass. So I, I would rather call it the quantum control of causal order or entanglement between uh, the, the position of the mass and the causal order between Alice and Bob. But anyway, I, I hope you get the idea. You have uh, uh, this process now represents directly a superposition of causal structures. Okay, so uh, so that's how you do it with, uh, with gravity. Uh, as I announced uh, at the beginning, it's, uh, uh, it's interesting that uh, you have uh, scenarios in the lab that can also be described by indefinite causal structures. Now, the, <coughs> the situation here is a bit different. We are not talking about indefinite space time or even any gravity or anything like that. We are talking about something as simple as an interferometer. Uh, the type of interferometer to make this example is, can be represented in this way. You have two polarizing these splitters. Um, um, these are, uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if you do it with polarization, you can use different degrees of freedom. Uh, but so essentially the point is that you have a, uh, some, some control system that, for example, can be a polarization of a photon and then some target uh, system that can be the frequency of the photon or the space mode of the photon or whatever degree of freedom that carries that flies through the photon. And now uh, the point is that in each path you put a, a device that performs some unit operation on the target and not on the control and you put a different device uh, a different unitary on one arm and the other. And so now we can see what happens if you prepare a controlling state zero that say is a, um, a, a, um, horizontal polarization so the polarizing splitter will let through horizontal polarization and reflect vertical polarization. So if yellow is horizontal, it goes through U0, goes through, goes around, goes through U1, goes around. And then you have uh, the, the control has not been changed, so it's in state zero, and then you have uh, the two operation U0 and U1, this one. And now if you put, uh, if you prepare in the other control state, so say vertical polarization, you first reflect U1, then you reflect again, you zero, you reflect and go out. So importantly, you go out in both cases in exactly the same point. So there is no other uh, loss of information throughout the system. Um, 
but in this case, uh, you will have this, the control in state one and the target in transform by first in one and then in zero. And of course, when you put the two things in superposition, uh, you know very well what will happen. Uh, you will end up with the superposition of the two scenarios. So zero, you want to zero phi, and one in zero, you want phi. So that's uh, uh, from the abstract point of view, from the just uh, uh, Hilbert space point of view, it's exactly the same as we've seen before. It's a quantum switch. Uh, the difference is now that the causal order is not because uh, uh, the events are localized in an indefinite space time. The point here is that the events, which is applying in unitary zero or unitary one, are delocalized in time. So um, I can play this again. And you see that uh, the two balls go, in this picture, they go twice through U zero and U one, uh, and twice at the same time. Um, so the thing is uh, um, that operationally, it's really only one operation that you perform and the fact that it looks like they're going through twice is just because we, 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 we show the move in this way uh, but operation you can very well argue that uh, it's only one operation act, acted on each side and um, and in this way you can uh, you can say that, that there is a, a, an indefinite causal structure realized in the lab so again there are different ways you can describe this scenario you can describe it with the usual quantum mechanics uh, but uh, um, but but uh, it, you can also describe it in, in this way so in this case there are uh, different equivalent ways to now, this is uh, uh, something that experimentalists had a lot of fun with. This is the first uh, setup that performed an experiment implementing uh, an indefinite causal structure. Here, the, the control was position and the target was polarization, so a bit different from what I've shown before. But I will not uh, work you through the, the setup just yet. Uh, essentially, the same thing. Depending on the position of the photon, it's, yeah, it goes either this way or that way, and then it goes either through the set of white plates or this set of white plates. And it does one order of the other. And there have been a lot of other experiments uh, um, with different uh, uh, setups, uh, all are based on photonics, on, uh, on, on uh, photon interference. Okay, why uh, should we be interested in this at all? Is it just a funny way to rewrite uh, known quantum experiments? Well, the reason we, we might be interested is that uh, there is an advantage. Uh, Indefinite causal structure give you an advantage for certain tasks. So for example, we found that there is a computational advantage uh, in a certain um, uh, um, computational problem using indefinite causal structure. Now here, the, the advantage is in query complexity, so it's in the number of uses of, of gates. And so in that case, it's really, really crucial that the, the setup you have uh, somehow genuinely performs one operation at, at each gate. And so uh, this is still, of course, an, a, a challenge to scale it up in a way where you will see the advantage, but uh, um, but that, that, that doesn't seem to be any abstraction in principle. Um, and then people have played around and uh, looking at other advantages in other type of tasks, tasks like quantum information type things, communication complexity, and many other things. Uh, maybe not all of that. Those. Uh, so for all of those tasks, one has to be a little careful to ask: is it uh, um, uh, is it justified in a, in a concrete operational setting? But in matter of principle, there are all these type of advantages. Okay, now uh, very brief uh, wheezing through other things that you can do with process matrices. Um, you can talk about uh, quantum and classical communication. You can uh, start to ask questions like, how do we calculate quantum capacities or uh, uh, channel capacities? So typically, when you have a channel, you have a sender and a receiver, you know in which order they are. Now what you have in definite causal structure or a non causal structure, how do you define uh, channel capacities? These are all things for which this formalism is very well suited. I just uh, just uh, list here um, uh, these two references. One interesting thing is that uh, uh, it never because the structure doesn't actually give you or it doesn't seem to give you uh, any advantage in terms of capacity. So if you have Alice and Mark are just trying to, sh to share, uh, to send information to each other, it doesn't look like they can really uh, share more information uh, just by having indefinite causal structure, even though there are advantages in other types of communication tasks. Other things you can do are closed time like curve. So this is a, when you have a, a, a classical space time that it's so twisted and, uh, and perverse that uh, allows you to travel back in time. Uh, this was not the original motivation of our work was more about quantum space time, but because uh, we have a framework where you can talk about events uh, whose, uh, without, uh, that you, where you can localize events without saying in which order they are, then it's also very well suited to talk about um, closed time like curves. And uh, other things uh, uh, you can do is uh, um, you can go a bit further uh, in the uh, analysis of uh, quantum gravitational scenarios 
Um, so the way I describe the, uh, the framework is a, a situation where, um, say, you have uh, you can identify your events in some operational way. So you say you have a clock, a relative to this clock, you have, a, you have an event. Now, in general relativity, you, you would like to have something more general where you don't have to specify in advance the clocks as something external to your system. You have to want to have something that is uh, generally um, a diffeomorphism invariance, which is, means uh, you have a, a description that is independent both of the background and the reference frame that you use. Then you can pick up which system you want to use in the reference frame within that. And so again, this is something that uh, you can work out uh, within this formalism, uh, how to encode uh, um, information about um, space time or about your events in the um, uh, in the reference in physical reference uh, systems. Okay, then a final thing that uh, maybe I will uh, I will briefly mention that you can do with this formalism uh, that it doesn't even have to do anything with the indefinite causal structure. So I mentioned at the very beginning that uh, uh, this is a formalism that is also used for people developed uh, the same type of generalized bond rule uh, even for definite uh, causal structure. So why is that? Um, uh, now the reason is that uh, if you want to talk about uh, general open quantum systems. Uh, there has actually been uh, quite some uh, discussion and, and uh, issues in the community uh, trying to understand how to do it. Uh, now, we'll try to very, very briefly uh, uh, explain what is the problem. Uh, how do you describe open quantum systems? Now, the, the most obvious way is to think, okay, um, I take a density matrix. That's what I get if I trace out part of my system. And I consider a density matrix that evolves in time. Now consider for a second what has been in the classical limit. The density matrix is a probability distribution. And so this gives you naturally a, a time change in probability distribution. And now you can ask, is this the way you, you represent the most general type of a, a classical stochastic process? And the answer is no. And, and the reason is that uh, very simply because uh, uh, in a classical stochastic process, what you, what you do is you consider events at different times. So time one, time two, time three, today, tomorrow, later. In general, you can have correlations, time correlations between these different events. And these time correlations can be mediated through an environment. And this environment might have a, a memory of all these uh, interactions. So the general classical stochastic process is a joint probability distribution of events at all different times. Um, and so, so clearly, uh, this is not uh, the, the, the time evolving density matrix is not the right object because it doesn't even give you the right classical limit. So what we need is a generalization of these. Uh, uh, joint probability distribution at multiple events. And so what you need is a generalization of state that instead of being a state that evolves in time, it's something like a joint state at different times. Now this is something that uh, it seems impossible because a state, you have a joint state between different systems at different places, but not a joint state at different times. But then if you look at it, that's exactly what the process matrix is. Uh, so maybe this is something I didn't emphasize enough, but uh, uh, now, when you, when you have a um, particular case of a, uh, a system, um, a causally ordered process um, that represents ideally a system evolving in time, now the process matrix formalizes this by putting a tensor product across all different times. So when I, we have all this level here, A, I, A, B, and so on, each of those represents a different tensor factor. So that's exactly uh, representing different events in time in the same way as you represent different uh, locations in space. And so this turns out to be actually the correct way to, co to consider non-Markovian processes. Uh, and this gives you really some advantage uh, over the, uh, the traditional way, which is uh, uh, time evolving density matrix. Okay, so this was maybe uh, quite a lot, but I hope you got some, uh, some glimpses of, uh, of this wonderful, form form wonderful formalism. So it's, uh, uh, okay, so this is the picture of what's going on here. You have the process matrix represents the blob, and now everything is totally ordered, but uh, the process matrix also tells you all the information you need to know, to know about how the external environment correlates the different events in time. Okay, so it's time to wrap up. So, okay, to summarize what we have seen, we've seen that main message is that uh, you can formulate quantum theory in a way that does not uh, need a, a background that causal structure. Um, so this is the main, uh, I guess, the main message. It, it makes sense, it makes operational sense. It makes physical sense, and, uh, and there is this formalism that has many applications. Uh, we have described, described indefinite causal order, so it's a scenario where not only you don't know in advance uh, the background causal structure, but it, it's not even compatible uh, with uh, 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 any def definite causal structure. And the main, uh, uh, the main message is that this is compatible with the local quantum theory. So you assume that 
quantum mechanics is valid at individual events where you make measurements and operations, and you can you define you find that the metric of structure is compatible uh, with quantum theory. Not only it's mathematically and logically compatible, but it's physically meaningful, and it's an example from combining quantum and gravity, and also examples in the lab where if you want. It's just a reinterpretation of known physics, but it's actually used for the reinterpretation. It, uh, it is, a, a, in this sense, a new resource in the sense uh, you, can, uh, um, you can see that you can perform certain tasks more efficiently uh, when, you, when you devise uh, experiments uh, within this formalism. And then finally, um, I briefly mentioned that the applications to open quantum systems, like especially open systems with memories and uh, quantum networks. And so this is a, uh, yeah, so that, that's it. So thank you very much for your attention. And thank you everybody who is uh, watching the uh, uh, delay. Thanks, Olivia. Uh, does anybody in the audience have any questions? Yeah, so the, the closed time like curves that you mentioned, are they like similar to Deutz model or the post electricities or are they completely different models? Yeah, excellent question. So uh, there are a subset of the post-selected uh, CTCs. And that's for exactly the same reason as uh, your first answer, that uh, you can see, so from the purely formal point of view, so if you ask what are the type of uh, processes that are allowed in this formalism, they form a subset of the post-selected processes. Um, so the, the, the idea is, uh, and, and yeah, and uh, um, close them like curves, uh, uh, the, the formalism of, uh, uh, post selected post term occurs is exactly formally equivalent to post selected quantum mechanics. So, something that you can do in a close term occurs in that formalism, you can simulate in a post selected uh, uh, scenario. The key difference, of mm -hmm. course, is that if a, a, post, a close term occurs, uh, it's supposed to do the post selection for you. So, that's something that's supposed to happen deterministically. You're not throwing away any, uh, any information. Now, uh, there is a, um, well, of course, we don't know how close term occurs, if they exist and how they actually work. Um, there are uh, reasons, maybe uh, more, um, yeah, so there are reasons uh, why it, it would be preferable to, uh, to consider this particular subset as opposed to, uh, to general uh, um, post-selected close term curves. Uh, but uh, certainly the don't, don't have any proof that, um, that yeah, that uh, close term curves only corresponds to process matrices and not to more general ones. It's just that uh, um, uh, there are some, uh, 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 some better feature in terms, for example, that they don't introduce any nonlinearity that you will have with the okay. post selected uh, close term like curves. And um, yeah, maybe there is a longer, longer discussion uh, related to Novikov's principle and the self consistency principle. If you consider that, uh, how uh, the analysis of classical time like curves uh, uh, happens, it also looks like that uh, post so post selection sort of uh, uh, you need it to resolve some types of uh, paradoxes that you get in uh, uh, classical close term like curves. But when you actually look a bit more closely at those paradoxes, they are already solved in the classical scenario. So it seems that you don't actually have those paradoxes to start with. So that's why I believe it is actually yeah. a relevant subset. But yeah, that's obviously mm -hmm. a much broader uh, topic on itself. Cool. And um, if you'd mentioned about a certain causal relation, causal structure. Yeah. Um, and is there any work showing like if you have a quantum clock, so I guess maybe you have some thermodynamic limitations on how precise you can be, how well defined you can have like each instant of time. So is there any work showing some type of advantage for us having some uncertainty about the logic of the order of some events just due to the use of a quantum clock? Yeah, that's very interesting. I don't think there is anything directly related to that that has been done. Um, so in general, if you have a, a clock, quantum or not, that has some uncertainty, then yes, that is one of the scenarios in which I expect you, uh, you can have uh, um, uncertain causal structures uh, arising. So certainly you can uh, use this formalism. So this was one of the ideas I mentioned at the beginning that you have things like quantum networks, and then you have some uh, built in uncertainty about uh, uh, the timing of the events. This leads you to, to some uncertain causal relation between the events. And so that's one of the things where you can try to use the formalism. We, we actually haven't done anything concrete about that. So that's something I would be very interested to, uh, to work on. I don't know about the uh, uh, advantages. So I think advantages, conceptually, I imagine that would be advantages in the sense of uh, 
exploiting the quantumness of the clock to get an advantage. These are, I don't know, I haven't thought about that. Okay, thank you. Do you think, um, do you think that the energy time uncertainty <coughs> relation is going to be directly related to uncertainty of causal order? <coughs> Um, again, it can be in the sense that, uh, um, for example, if you want uh, to have your events, if you want to have some measurements that, uh, uh, that measure very precisely energy, then clearly they will not be able to be very well localized in time. Yeah. And so, yes, um, there is a little of a subtlety there. Uh, when is it appropriate to, uh, to call those? Uh, um, so there is a, yeah, an assumption I didn't, uh, I, I didn't make very clear about uh, um, something that we call closed laboratory assumptions. So when you think about uh, um, a causally order scenario, uh, the naive picture is uh, you have a system coming in the lab, stays in the lab while you do the operation, and then goes out. And then uh, it goes to the other um, to the other laboratories. Now, if you have an independent product structure, it's not uh, completely clear how to operationally make sense of, uh, of these assumptions. Because uh, uh, you have to say the system stays in while you do the operation, and then Clear. The while is not well yeah, defined at that defined. point. Yeah. So, so the thing is that if you if you start to think about say an Alice and Bob that try to measure energy and therefore they take a long time, what will typically happen and they're just next to each other and things take time between each other. What will typically happen is that uh, um, it's not even an indefinite color structure. It's just uh, um, two. Uh, so the final thing that cannot be really represented as two independent measurements of energy. Because you have that information and energy flying in between the two things, and so you have to really generally consider that thing as, as one. So there is a sort of bootstrap way here that you can see if you have two operations and you can fit them in the core momentum, then you can a posteriori say uh, you can interpret them as closed laboratory, uh, which is a little bit like you you understand a, a subsystems in quantum theory. If you have a particle and you have some degree of freedom, you can make some operation. You can say. If I can represent two observable uh, as acting on tensor factor in the Hilbert space, I can say they're independent degrees of freedom. But in principle, if you if you consider two different operations on the same system, they might not really be on different degrees of freedom. They might be just mixing up things. Um, the only other question that I had was actually really not a specific question. I was just hoping you could tell us a little bit more about the open quantum systems application to this. Yeah. So. Um, Right. So a little more. So um, so this is a work that has attracted a lot of uh, attention, especially by another group. I mentioned their work in in this little list of uh, equivalent formalism. So a group of Kamamodi and there is Felix Pollocks and uh, other people at Monash University. Um, and so there are a lot of things you can do. The first thing you can do is to formally take all the things you know about uh, classical stochastic process and and map them. To, um, to the quantum case. Um, the other thing you can do is to show how wrong is this picture, uh, which I don't know if I should, uh, I mean, the picture of the time recording state. Um, I don't know how much I, I want to spend on that, but uh, um, so the thing is, uh, um, of, of course, it's not wrong to talk about the time evolving state. Uh, it's just, uh, uh, I guess, important to understand what does it mean operationally. So in the process matrix picture, if you talk about the time evolving state, that's essentially the same as saying, but well, everybody, everybody in this sequence of measurements is doing not, nothing except, say, the, the, the agent at time t. And so this means that uh, depending on, uh, so you can, you can derive this picture from the process matrix picture. Now, if you try to think of that as a, in the usual way, that there is a, uh, this is a complete description of the system and it has a time evolution and so on, uh, you really get something that is, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense because, for example, you don't always get something where it, the state of time t is a function of a state of time zero, because uh, because there is this environment and what is the state of time t can just depend on what the environment is decided to do, and uh, it's not even a well-defined function. So there are a lot of things that, that really go wrong there. Um, so some of the works that I have done, um, well, one of the things is yeah to de describe how do you do tomography of these type of processes and so on. One of the things I have done is a sort of a leveraging of this uh, analogy because the one thing you can see is that you have this direct analogy now between the processing time and the, and the state. And so you can sort of play, play with this and see how much uh, you, can, uh, you can get. So one of the things is, for example, to um, use the analogy between uh, um, analogy coming from entanglement, so distinguishing entangled and non-entangled systems. 
and uh, you can get something that from that that allows you to describe uh, to distinguish between classical and quantum environment. So essentially, here you have uh, you are describing the system that is interacting with some external environment, and now you can consider what is the subset of process that can be simulated by just having a classical environment. Which means a classical environment means that at each time step uh, there is some classical there is some perhaps some measurement of the system and then some classical record and feed forward the classical record. And um, yeah, that, that's quite interesting. And so you can have a proper definition, and you can see, for example, you can have a semi-definite programming that, that distinguishing the, uh, that identifies where you have a non-classical structure, and that's that's tightly related to entanglement, although not exactly related. There are some interesting stuff to compare to. But uh, but yeah, so this is actually something. Um, yeah, I, I started to work on like, only a few works, but uh, yeah, it is a very interesting direction because. Uh, it's actually very relevant for a uh, for a uh, current experiment where uh, the current formalism doesn't actually work anymore. So people do things like randomized benchmarking for for quantum chips and things like that, and they all assume Markovian dynamics. And uh, yeah, people are a bit confused how to to do that in the non Markovian case, and that's actually the the, the right formalism. Yeah, my, my last question about this is probably just a yes or no answer. So do you think that this uh, process basic matrix formalism is um, sort of the most general way you can treat uh, an environment? Uh, do you think it kind of covers the quantum, the classical, and maybe other things we haven't imagined? Uh, well, uh, or, or can you imagine some things that might be outside the scope of this model? So I, so this is the most general uh, within uh, quantum physics, so let's say within uh, known quantum physics. So if you think of them, so, so the, the point here is that this is the most general and kind of most efficient, in the sense that you can also describe a system environment interaction just by giving a full description of the environment. But that gives you a lot of redundant information if you only care about uh, measuring the system itself. But so if you're talking about something that you can describe uh, in general as some initial pure state, but it's an initial state that evolves through some unitary of joint system and environment, and there is this bunch of events, then yes, you can prove that this is the, the most general. So actually, the interesting thing is that it's an if and only if, that the process, a uh, causally ordered process matrix because uh, the order process matters like exactly all and only the processes that can emerge from system environment interaction. Um, now, if you have something that is, for example, beyond quantum theory, then yeah, of course, no. I mean, I don't know, but it's fact. Okay. Yeah, this is kind of what I'm getting at is we go to like post quantum theories that have like pure boxes. Yeah, um, then, then I would expect you would need some post quantum process matrix. I see. All right, I think that's about all the time we have. Uh, thanks again, Fabio, for coming and presenting. Thank you. This has been very interesting. Yeah, thanks everybody. Again, um, any other questions in the audience? All right, all right. Let's uh, let's call it. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.